Mr. Teo Chihen, Senior Minister and Coordinating Minister for National Security, Your Excellencies, Ladies and Gentlemen, a very warm welcome to all of you. I'm delighted to see so many of you in person. But I'm pleased that Ecosperity hybrid format allows delegates, delegates from many countries to join our discussions. So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. The theme for this eighth edition of Ecosperity is accelerating action at scale. It reflects the brisk activities needed in the race to net zero. As countries transition to more sustainable economies. Even as we learn to live with COVID-19, it is vital that we stay focused on the climate agenda because we are seeing energy consumption and carbon emissions soar beyond pre-COVID levels. Many of us are well aware why climate action needs to be dialed up and on a broader scale amid the looming climate crisis. Last year was possibly a record year for net zero pledges. This tempo is indicative of a growing collective awareness by countries and businesses to do more on climate action and to do it faster because time is running out. In Singapore, the government announced in February that the carbon tax will be progressively raised to meet Singapore's target of achieving net zero by 2050. The market welcomes this announcement about the carbon tax. Putting an appropriate price on carbon helps to better guide investment and operational decisions. We set our own internal carbon price of 42 US dollars per tonne of carbon dioxide equivalent last year, and we'll look to increase this progressively over this decade. The carbon tax will allow us to model the likely future impact of carbon pricing on the investments that Amasek makes, while recognizing the societal costs that emissions will impose over time. Singapore's net zero ambitions set a specific time frame for businesses in Singapore to work towards. For Tamase, the quest to net zero began a few years ago. Having achieved carbon neutrality, we committed to aim for a net zero portfolio by 2050. The net zero pledges in Singapore and across the planet are important signals to the market to accelerate change. The key levers to accelerate climate action are in three areas, technology, policy, and green financing. Technology can help transform words into deeds. Given time and funding, novel solutions in areas ranging from food and renewable energy to materials and much more have demonstrated how technology can deliver sustainable solutions. There are many companies working on new forms of technology whose efforts could benefit from the catalytic effects of angel and early stage investors. Catalytic capital can make a difference when injected in meaningful amounts and at critical junctures of the life cycle of such enterprises. It is essential that startups are given maximum opportunities for success, and we hope events like Ecosperity can catalyze the success of budding new ideas. Policy frameworks need to facilitate the adoption of new standards for sustainable solutions. Let me illustrate why the right policy frameworks are vital. If you are flying across oceans on an airliner powered by sustainable aviation fuel, 
made from waste cooking oil and animal fats, you want assurance that the fuel is safe. The battery in an electric vehicle needs to be certified for performance and fire safety before you buy it. And low carbon cement would need to be rigorously tested and certified by building authorities before it can be used for structures. So policy frameworks backed by testing must move quickly. Technology will present sustainable solutions that are so innovative that they fall outside current regulations. But we need to find the balance to allow early adoption of safe, transformative technologies. There's also an important role for finance. Deployment of capital must be thoughtful because the solutions will have a trajectory of their own and can, look, and can lock in decisions for decades. Backing a source of renewable energy will see heavy investments in infrastructure tailored for a specific power source. Such decisions are difficult to unwind because a power plant, for instance, configured for one energy source cannot be reconfigured for another without significant cost. No one has a monopoly on ideas. We value the exchange of ideas and international collaboration that sustainability theme forums and global summits aim to nurture. At last month's World Economic Forum in Davos, there were calls to go beyond net zero to net negative if the 1.5 degrees target is to be achieved. So we hear this message loud and clear. Recent eco-sparity themes show how the agenda of at such events has raised the ambition. In 2019, we talk about translating ambition to action. Last year, we reflected on moving from crisis to opportunity. This year, Ecosperity committed to accelerating action at scale. Ecosperity Week this year will dive into tangible solutions for the energy transition, decarbonizing hard to abate sectors like transportation and the heavy industry, and in financing Asia's green transition. Many delegates will also be involved in activities on the sidelines. These include a, a key announcement by the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero, better known as GFANZ, and the convening of the Civil Aviation Authority of Singapore's International Advisory Panel that will look at sustainable air hubs. Carbon market events will also feature prominently. This follows the launch yesterday of Gen Zero, the Masses carbon solutions platform that will spearhead our efforts to catalyze decarbonization solutions and the carbon market ecosystem. Through Gen Zero, the Masik will support the global transition to a low carbon economy across the carbon value chain. At Ecosperity last year, I described climate as the most critical element of our shared collective future. There are no returns from a dead planet. We stand at a watershed moment where actions taken today to address the climate crisis will define the future for generations to come. Our shared commitment to accelerate climate action is critical as it will help shape a more sustainable world. On that note, I'm heartened to see a record number of partners at Ecosperity Week, and I thank them all for their 
continued support. It leads me now to wish all of you a successful and meaningful Ecosperity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Lim, for setting the stage for Ecosperity Week 2022. Uh, we know we'll be seeing you here on stage in just a little bit. Uh, and thank you, of course, for highlighting how technology and how policy and green financing is really the way to ramp up uh, Singapore's efforts in the green transition. And of course, when you have government and private sector working together, and you do it in unison, in concert, you can really reach that, uh, that scale that we've been alluding to, which is why we are so grateful today to have our guest of honor with us. So please join me in welcoming the Senior Minister and Coordinating Minister for National Security, Mr. Tio Chi Hien. Thank you. Mr. Lim Boon Heng, Chairman of the Masek Holdings, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to see many familiar faces in the audience today. I'm pleased to join everyone here in person at Ecosperity Week 2022, as well as those of our friends who are coming in virtually. Climate change belongs to that class of problems likened to the boiling frog. In this case, we are the frog. If we do nothing about it today, nothing is likely to happen or change significantly today or tomorrow or this year or the next. But by the time we feel the effects in a significant way, we have already lost a decade or decades of time. Time when action could have been taken, time lost forever, which we cannot recover. We have already passed that point. We already see the significant effects of climate change everywhere. And we have to make up for lost time and need to take urgent and more decisive action now. In the past year, international resolve to reduce greenhouse gas emissions has grown. As part of COP26 Glasgow Climate Pact, all parties should aim to achieve global net zero emissions by mid-century in order to keep the 1.5 degree goal within reach. There is significant momentum to decarbonize. More than 80 countries have pledged net zero emissions by 2050, including 11 in Asia. We also reached a significant milestone at COP26 last year with the finalization of the Paris rulebook. Singapore was happy to contribute to the finalization of Article 6 on international carbon markets. This would not only facilitate cross-border trading of high-integrity carbon credits, but also catalyze new green growth opportunities. Effective high-integrity carbon markets are important for Singapore, given our alternative energy disadvantage. Discussion at COP26 also saw momentum shift towards increased private sector investment in clean solutions. The Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero, a coalition of 400 financial firms, pledged to make over 120 trillion US dollars of private capital available for investment to reach global net zero by 2050. This will provide access to private finance for countries with less means to decarbonize. Singapore has also signaled our support for the Glasgow Climate Pact by announcing our net zero target to be achieved by or around mid-century. This provides a clear target for our businesses and individuals to work towards. It is also an invitation for more businesses to partner us here in Singapore and tap the business opportunities in the growing regional green economy. Last year, Singapore launched the Singapore Green Plan 2030, a whole of nation movement to integrate and implement our, our plans for sustainable development 
across environmental, economic, energy, transport and built environment sectors and to nurture the next generation as stewards in environmental sustainability. And later this year, we will update our long-term low emissions development strategy or LEDS, which was published in 2020 with our revised plans to achieve Singapore's net zero goals by 2050. And before we finalize our plans, we will consult closely with industry and citizen stakeholder groups. We all need to work together and play our part through three key pathways. And I echo what Chairman Lim Boon Heng has said. Policy, private initiative, and R&D. And let me speak a little on each of these. First, policy. Policy has an important role in setting the framework for and achieving eco-prosperity, which is not just about reducing carbon emissions. Eco-prosperity is about achieving our sustainable development goals, creating a circular economy in which we eliminate waste and maximize the value of our natural resources and building sustainable, livable cities. Government needs to have the right policies that get to the root of the problem and help create solutions at the system level. For example, sustainable urban transportation. It's not just about replacing all internal combustion engine vehicles with electric vehicles. If we did that, we would convert our traffic jams with ICE vehicles today to traffic jams with electric vehicles. Instead, the more fundamental system solution is to minimize the need for cars through well-integrated urban planning and a comprehensive public transport system. This is why Singapore has invested heavily in public transport and since 2018 implemented a zero growth policy for our vehicle population. We aim to be a 45 minute city in 2040, where nine out of 10 trips between homes and workplaces will take less than 45 minutes on our public transport network, even during peak hours. Today, we are already two thirds there. Climate change is the classic example of the tragedy of the commons. We need policies to accurately reflect economic benefits and costs to nudge businesses and individuals towards the desired behavior. For example, a carbon tax can ensure that the negative externalities of carbon emissions are correctly priced and borne by the parties contributing to these emissions. It is also an effective mechanism to spur economy-wide decarbonization efforts. Singapore was the first Southeast Asian country to introduce a carbon tax, and we recently set out a clear timeline to raise our broad-based carbon tax to reach between 50 Singapore dollars to 80 Singapore dollars per tonne by 2030. We introduced policies to support and encourage businesses to pursue energy efficiency, such as the Resource Efficiency Grant for Energy. And we also have the Climate Friendly Household Package to incentivize households to switch to more energy efficient equipment by subsidizing their upfront costs. We hope that with the right policies, we can change behavior into habits and embed environmental sustainability more meaningfully in the national psyche. Second, private initiative. Climate change requires all hands on deck, including and especially the private sector. Businesses will be affected not just by the primary effects of climate change, but also by the second and third order effects, disrupting the operating models and supply chains. Growing awareness about the climate crisis has also changed how people define value in business and what values a company upholds. Climate policies, technological advancements, and stakeholder preferences will fundamentally impact what is the sustainable value of a company and its valuation in the long term. 
Companies can no longer solely focus on short-term returns from current assets and business lines. Financial institutions, some of them, have discovered that that is so too. Shareholders, creditors, customers, and even your employees will demand more sustainable practices and plans. To remain competitive in the long term, businesses need to incorporate decarbonisation and climate risks into their strategies. As demand for sustainable practices increase, first movers will capture upsides while laggards may be written off as doing too little too late. Questions will be asked about your company's strategies to avoid stranded assets or legacy lines of production that may be rendered obsolete. The oil and gas industry has already found itself under the spotlight. The big five oil giants have responded by pledging to reduce emissions. Shell, ExxonMobil and Chevron, which have major operations in Singapore, have committed to reach net zero emissions by 2050. The private sector and private finance have important roles to play in our shift towards the green economy, be it by providing investments to plug the financing gap or by taking the lead in adopting greener business models. Sustainable private financing and corporate net zero targets have a powerful mutually reinforcing effect. By drawing capital preferentially towards sustainable projects and new opportunities in the global green economy. This, in turn, makes it more difficult and expensive for companies to obtain financing if their projects are not green. I'm happy that the MASIC has recently launched Gen Zero, an investment company focused on carbon markets and accelerating decarbonisation solutions. It invests in companies across tech-based solutions, nature-based solutions, and carbon, carbon ecosystem enablers, and supports both early stage and later stage companies to scale, commercialize, and deploy their solutions. This will direct more private capital towards green opportunities and encourage companies to place greater emphasis on delivering sustainable long-term financial returns. And Singapore intends to switch our economy towards the growing green economy. Third, R&D. We need to invest in research and develop innovative solutions to tackle the climate crisis. If we use technology right, it can be a valuable tool to help us overcome resource constraints and unlock greener and more sustainable solutions. To do this effectively, we need to adopt an ecosystem approach. The government to create a conducive environment that promotes green opportunities. The private sector to invest in emerging technologies. The scientific and research community to focus on developing innovative solutions. And all sectors working together to cross-fertilize and generate new ideas. Singapore, more than many other countries, will have to depend on technological innovations which have not been developed yet or implemented in, on a scale yet in order to decarbonize. And that's why we are putting a focus on R&D. Singapore has been making critical investments in R&D to build new capabilities to pursue sustainable development. Our Research, Innovation and Enterprise, or RIE 2025 plan, sets aside around 25 billion Singapore dollars, or 18.3 billion US dollars, for research in strategic domains, including urban solutions and sustainability, what we call the science of cities. We think of Singapore as a living lab, providing space for businesses to test bid and commercialize solutions, deploying autonomous vehicles, or even smart energy grids that can lower energy usage, distribute green energy such as solar power seamlessly across the district, 
and detect abnormal energy consumption. In particular, we need to continue to explore emerging technologies that could bring about more sustainable solutions in the longer term, such as carbon capture utilization and storage, and green hydrogen. Singapore has also been putting in place the building blocks to support a high-integrity carbon credits ecosystem by developing robust methods for accounting in nascent areas like blue carbon nature-based solutions and exploring satellite technology for measuring and monitoring. We invite like-minded researchers and investors to use Singapore not just as a test bed, but a launch pad to build regional capabilities. We hope this helps to unlock the potential of the Asia-Pacific region and develop mutually beneficial partnerships and solutions for our climate challenge. Tackling climate change is not just about mitigating carbon emissions, but also adaptation to deal with the consequences of more extreme weather and sea level rise. Low-lying island states like Singapore are particularly vulnerable to this. We have been conducting research in coastal protection and planning for the real prospect that sea levels will rise by up to one meter by 2100. For example, we have raised the minimum land, the re land reclamation level in Singapore by an additional meter since 2011 to bring the, mac the minimum reclamation level of new land to two meters above the highest ever recorded tides in Singapore. We have also divided our coastal areas into hydraulically distinct segments to study different options for each area and when to phase in our coastal protection measures. We estimate that this will require about 100 billion Singapore dollars over the next 50 years until the end of the century. You will have read in today's newspapers some of these plans, including the so-called Long Island of the East Coast. And this is an innovative solution which will help to protect what is the East Coast today, which is relatively low-lying. But instead of building in a great hurry uh, uh, sea walls to protect the East Coast or pumping stations, we intend to develop our coastal protection in a way which may well give us a positive return by reclaiming land offshore in order to have developable land, developable land which we can use in land scarce Singapore while at the same time providing that coastal protection to the vulnerable East Coast. And in this way, by planning ahead, looking ahead, we can not just give coastal protection, but we can produce new land and perhaps devise a way in which we can get a positive return from coastal protection rather than simply building seawalls. We have made significant progress over the last few years. In the past, our efforts were focused on the why, making the case for the climate and the need for action. But today, we have moved on to talk about the how. We see businesses making ambitious plans and developing greener, cleaner solutions at a rapid pace. As prices of renewables fall, and cleaner forms of transport and infrastructure options grow, the path ahead is clearer. Singapore is prepared to play in the frontier of the how and form partnerships involving the public, private and people sectors to create new solutions. To achieve our objectives, we will require great resolve and commitment to action from all parties. Recent global developments, like the tragedy in Ukraine and the knock-on effects on the energy market, demonstrate how easy it may be to set us back. What remains certain 
is that no matter what happens, we must continue to stay steadfast in our collective ambition to create a better, greener, safer, more secure and sustainable world. And our determination to continuously innovate and find the best pathway to achieve net zero. I thank the MASEC and all of you for bringing us together as part of Eco, Eco Sparity Week and wish all participants fruitful and meaningful discussions. All the very best to all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senior Minister Tio.